Okay, hit it. It's October 30th, 2020, episode 103. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we have a special guest, Josh Young from Bison Interests, who specializes in energy investing, joins us. We talk about the macro picture for oil and gas, and he gives us a couple of companies poised to take advantage of the current dire environment. Then we get Brent Kuchuba from Spot Gamma, who gives us a special election day gamma setup that you don't want to miss. After that, we get to talking charts where Patrick gives us his updates on the latest squiggles. In this week in trading history, we go back to when Mickey Mouse bought Star Wars. Taylor jumps on with his WTF clip of the week, and we end with our segments of No Stupid Questions and Skin in the Game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We've got a great show. Lena, hop on. Now, what beer are we drinking this week? So today we're drinking Full Steam Stout from Rare Bird Craft Beer Brewery. A hearty brew, our nicely hopped Full Steam Stout serves up notes of licorice, chocolate and roast and malt we add our freshly roasted certified organic fair trade full steam coffee to the brewing process to create a richly flavored creamy coffee stout that pours as black as a starless night <laughs> it's uh it's interesting uh, yeah <laughs> it's a strong beer though it's, it's, uh, it's i don't know if it should be served cold or hot it tastes so much like oh it's five it, percent it's a it's uh it's full body taste that's for sure uh, kev why don't you give us a disclaimer Okay, let's get to it. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include the U.S. O.N.O.s, E.D., that is earnings drops, known as Halloweenies, and Antipo fever. Sorry, I meant anti-IPO fever. <laughs> All right, let's get on with the show. It's my privilege to welcome to the show, uh, Josh Young. Josh is the managing partner and founder and CIO of Bison Interests. And Bison Interests is a hedge fund that specializes in oil and gas. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long while because I think there's some big opportunities and I'm looking forward to getting into the weeds with Josh. Josh, welcome to the show. Cool. Thank you for having me. So let's learn a little bit about yourself. Uh, how did you get into oil and gas? Um, uh, I guess I like to joke that, uh, it's a series of increasingly poor decisions. Um, so I studied economics at university of Chicago. I did management consulting out of school, private equity, um, principal investments for a family office, uh, primarily on the public side, and then, uh, went out on my own and got increasingly focused on oil and gas. Um, mostly there's this principle of cumulative advantage as, um, as you learn more about something you're able to avoid or at least reduce the number of dumb decisions that you make related to it and increase your chances of, of doing well with it. That's great. So now you went to the University of Chicago. You obviously got indoctrinated with the Chicago School of uh, Thought in terms of economics, or have you pushed back against that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm full on. I mean, I went to University of Chicago because my grandpa got his math PhD there, right. and when I visited... They had a symposium in honor of Milton Friedman. And so I got to actually, as a 17-year-old, uh, meet Milton Friedman, Gary Becker, Bob Lucas, and like five other Nobel Prize winning University of Chicago economists. And it answered the question of like what school I was going to go to as well as what I was going to study and to some extent what I was going to do in life. So did you find that uh, now as MMT and these new school of economic thoughts are kicking in, are you just shuddering? Yeah, I mean, I think that generally as a society, we've made a series, as a society, we've made a series of maybe even worse decisions than I've made from a career perspective. And, um, you know, I don't think that anyone thinks that borrowing and spending increasing amounts of money is going to yield a positive long term outcome. There we go. True Chicago school of thought there. So now you were actually from Santa Monica, you were telling me before the show. And I, I thought to myself, here's a guy who's figured life out. He's actually from the greatest place. And then you move out to a cold, windy Chicago. What was that like? Uh, it was a shock. I mean, I kind of knew anywhere I'd go other than like La Jolla, if I'd chosen to go to UCSD or something, anywhere else was going to be worse weather. So I decided to go kind of where my passion was. And that involved freezing for four years. So now, d growing up in Santa Monica, did you surf? 
Or were you a skateboarder? Uh, I, I skateboarded. Uh, I learned how to body surf. So um, instead of you know gracefully you know um, being standing on a board and like sliding down waves, uh, body surfing involves throwing your body into a wave and trying to shape it like a board. And uh, essentially, you're the board instead of the surfer. <laughs> Well, that's great. So now let's let's get into this energy. And one of the things that we were chatting about is that you think that eventually we're running out of oil, or as you say, eventually we're running out of cheap oil. Why don't you walk me through kind of your macro big picture thinking in terms of the energy markets? Sure. So um, one thing that I've noticed and, um, you know, my, my introduction into professional public market investing was the 2008 uh, financial crisis. I, I joined uh, my, my first uh, professional job in investing public equity money started in late 2007. And you know that was a time frame where people were starting to adopt this concept of peak oil. They had noticed that the Saudi fields and Cantarell and, and offshore Mexico and certain other places um, were um, starting to uh, peak out and we're showing early signs of potential um, substantial reservoir degradation. And um, so, so this was something that um, people were looking a lot over that kind of 2007 to 2010 or so time frame at housing, at oil, at other commodities, and looking at kind of long-term demand trends versus long-term supply trends. And so unlike housing, where you can build new houses in places people want to live, like Texas, like Arizona, like Nevada, um, and all you have to deal with is just the physical cost of building plus some nominal cost for land. Um, for oil, you had to go and discover a new reservoir or go to a reservoir that was impossible to extract oil from previously and come up with a new method um, and, and you know similar sorts of things from a geologic perspective for mining uh, various resources, uh, at least certain ones. I mean, iron ore you can just literally scrape off like a good portion of uh, Western Africa is just like iron ore sand. Um, but for oil, there there was some significant difficulty in adding incremental production, and the long run supply picture um, versus the long run demand picture was very favorable. Long run demand had been growing. Um, by over 1% a year for decades. And even as engines were getting more efficient, um, China and India and certain other emerging markets were becoming developing and then were going to be developed markets. And there was a huge catch up necessary in terms of oil consumption to, to get those. And we're still experiencing that right now. Right. So let's, let's go first on the supply side. Uh, this was around the time when uh, Twilight in the Desert was written. Do you view that book as, as a failure or was he just early? So I've actually met the people that changed the Saudi reservoirs that fixed the problem that he identified. So okay. he was right about the problem they had and he was wrong about the ability to apply giant amounts of capital and innovative technology to solve the problem that he identified. So, um, and it's one of those things where he might have actually, if you think about it, like from a quantum mechanics perspective, him observing the problem and then writing about it might have actually changed the outcome where the Saudis paid a lot of attention uh, to, to Matt Simmons. I mean, he was someone they respected, even though he kind of uncovered their secret. Um, and on the backside of that, they brought in brilliant people spent a giant amount of money and fixed at least, or at least, you know, kind of delayed the problem that he identified uh, by 10 to 20 years. Right. Cause to some extent, if they hadn't, and it's not like you can fix the problem 10 years later and it's, it's, it's easily fixed, right? It, it becomes uh, one of these things that the longer you let it go, the bigger the problem occur, uh, it ends up being right. Well, there's kind of this joke, um, Another guest that you've had on the show, he likes to joke about this with me. So Al Jazeera, for various reasons, has decided they really like having me on their um, brought on their news broadcasts, and I think they like it because of my view on this, which is um, that Saudi's oil fields. I mean, they're much higher cost than they represent, and you know now Aramco has kind of like semi-real financials out there, and you can kind of see this. But like, it's way more expensive to get oil out from there, and 
um, it's way more difficult and risky than they show. And they basically have this giant secondary and tertiary recovery project where they're pumping hundreds of millions of gallons. I think it might even be over a billion gallons of seawater into their um, reservoirs every day to be able wow. to extract oil. For those who don't know, um, Josh is a friend of our of our good friend Cuppy. So that's who he's, he's referring to. Um, so let's talk about the other side. So that's the supply side. Uh, let's talk about the demand side. You mentioned the fact that it was growing at 1% even though over the past decade or two, even though engines are getting more efficient. And you mentioned both India and China. I, I've often talked about the hockey stick formation that if you look back on the energy use per capita as a society gets more prosperous and you look at Japan after World War II and then you look at Korea uh, in the 70s, I think, or 80s, you'll see a situation where it goes up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then it explodes higher and it ends up being that you get to the, the hockey stick formation portion of it. Do you think that, that China is at the point where it's going to explode in terms of demand or is it going to continue just being a slow grind higher? Like what, what do you see on the demand side? So, so COVID kind of threw things off obviously in terms of air travel and certain other things. Um, one of the things that I like about a very long-term trend that's held almost exactly almost every year for again, like decades is that I don't actually need to, think about that to some extent. I mean, I do think about it and I have an opinion, but my opinion about it kind of almost doesn't matter. It matters in terms of, hey, will there be a surprise year up five or 10 or something percent for world oil? And, you know, it'd be good to know, but like, I think there's this trap. Um, I joke when people ask about, hey, what do you think the price of oil is going to be or what's going to happen short term that my crystal ball was broken? And so I think that sort of that that's a, a really difficult question. And if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be working, right? You, you could trade <laughs> options on futures uh, with right. short duration and catch that. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, I think we were actually starting to see something like that with air travel, like inter Asia air travel um, over the last couple of years, right before COVID. Um, right. And it might've actually been one of the reasons that COVID spread so quickly and so aggressively outside of China was like just so many flights from China to other places. Um, there are some reasons why it's it's hard for India and China to expand their um, their oil consumption more than linearly, uh, just like, you know, congestion, um, dense urban populations. Um, you know, there's other factors that, that come into like, you're probably not going to have more oil consumption in the city of Beijing next year than you have this year, excluding COVID. Right. So Josh, one of the things that uh, one of my readers told me the other day when I was bullish on energy, they told me, be careful, you might be on the wrong side of history. And obviously, as the, we get ESG and we get movement to electricity, uh, I was wondering what you might tell that reader in terms of the, the pushback in terms of energy as an investment opportunity given that we have this big shift going on from a societal point of view? Well, I, I think that um, to some extent they might be right, but that might just mean that I make more money. And to the extent you own oil and gas stocks, you make more money than you or I are thinking. Um, if you look at a oil price chart versus like a whale oil chart as whale oil got phased out, um, <laughs> it, it's not bad. It like doesn't suck to be in on the wrong side of history. Um, you know, tobacco companies are on the wrong side of history. I, I guess you just don't want to be coal. And there are a lot of reasons to think that oil isn't coal. And maybe coal isn't coal. Like maybe coal has another kind of future or another kind of set of legs. Um, but, uh, you know, that's kind of just purely from like a financial perspective. Um, you know, if you're thinking about going and becoming an oil engineer versus going and becoming an electrical engineer or some other sort of engineer, that's a whole different conversation and much more complicated but just purely from like a fundamental supply and demand and therefore price perspective, um, I mean, it's going to be a long time before um, before electric vehicles, before you know, much more efficient vehicles, whatever, really start to cut into that one percent plus demand growth that we've seen. And again, that's kind of where it's nice to get to do that, where you kind of 
if you have to defend every single one of these things, you can kind of miss the forest for the trees. And, and I think that person might be missing the forest for, for the trees. So I got, I got to ask, I, I didn't even know there was a whale oil chart. Where did you dig that up? <laughs> uh, Google. I think if you just look on Google Images, you can find these things. I mean, whale oil, as like the the function there was that the supply fell off a cliff um, because we unfortunately almost harvested whales to extinction, and um, that actually was one of the big drivers of the adoption of crude oil or rock oil, as it was called then, um, was just kerosene from whales uh, going to astronomical prices versus where they had been even a few years before. Right. So the greenies should be happy that we're not using whale oil still. Um, okay. So let's dig into it and, and think about what you're investing in. Obviously, this distaste for energy stocks has resulted in them getting absolutely crushed. It's uh, I, in terms of like you go look at the XLE the, 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 or any sort of index, the damage that has been done to these stocks has been immense. Do you think that we're at the point of maximum pain this late fall day? Uh, my crystal ball's broken. I don't. Know. <laughs> but you don't think it matters. You think that? So, do you want to talk about what what you're buying and what you which ones you like in terms of in terms of investment opportunities? Well, I think I think there's still a little bit more high level stuff that we should talk about before okay, we sure. get to that because there's still like a little bit of. Before you say, hey, XYZ stock is interesting or, you know, ABC stock is, is terrible, um, you know, there's a few things that, that I think are, are worth uh, pointing out. So one, the name of my firm, Bison. Um, bison's the only four-legged animal that when there's a storm, it faces into the storm and it gets through it safer, faster, and better. The other animals turn and run away. So um, there is a certain amount of stubbornness associated with that, but there is also a certain amount of practicality. So that, that is kind of my orientation generally. It's not, obviously I don't want to lose money or experience multiple down years uh, from a mark to market perspective, but like there is this concept of, okay, I see this thing and it is hard, but I can own things that'll survive and that are gonna be worth way more on the other side. And so instead of trying to time it, I'll just find the things at the best possible prices, buy them. And then if I find even better things, I'll sell those and buy these other things. But being able to focus on kind of where you're trying to get to and survivability through the storm rather than just like trying to time the storm, run away from it, and then go back. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and then one other thing, which is just like from a governance perspective, I think there's like a significant problem in our society and I think it's similar to kind of this idea of borrowing money and printing money to solve problems. And I actually started my career at Towers Perrin doing executive compensation consulting. And I lasted there about two months because my job was to rationalize overcompensating um, CEOs and boards. And um, I had this other job lined up to do strategy consulting and whatever, but I really wanted to do this exec comp at least for a little while to understand like how the world worked and the world works in a way that it shouldn't. And I'm obviously very Chicago school oriented, but like free markets mean free markets, not like free markets for everyone. And then socialism for the top, like 0.1%. And there are very severe problems with governance in our society. And like, it's almost comical that like this ESG movement is like, has almost everything backwards. It's like, Hey, let's go mine really, complicated environmentally damaging rare earth metals and stuff to build solar panels will ignore the mining part and we'll just focus on oh hey look solar panels don't have direct emissions themselves um, and similarly governance wise oil and gas companies have had atrocious governance um, but so have almost all other companies we just don't see the other ones because there's so much money printing and so much other stuff that you know because these other sectors aren't as out of favor uh, it just looks like everything is like fine where there's actually this giant governance problem. So a lot of the underperformance by oil and gas companies um, or a lot of like bad performance by those companies uh, is because of unforced errors by management and by their boards. Um, and so there's some of this value destruction that's attributed to everything being unpopular. 
And there's a lot of it that's attributed to people just being dumb and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So, Josh, I was listening to Jeff Curry, the uh, commodity analyst at Goldman Sachs, and he laid out a great bullish argument on commodities in general. Uh, the fact that basically COVID and a bunch of other things are going to cause less capital to be allocated to these resor- to these resources. And ultimately, that's going to mean that we're going to have less supply of this, which will mean higher prices in the future. But one of the things that I thought was interesting was that he did not include energy in there. He said that energy was still going to have a situation where it was going to go down for some time, or specifically oil. I was wondering whether you think that the industry is getting sufficiently, uh, I wouldn't say starved, but actually, uh, let's just say that the, the easy, cheap money is no longer chasing those assets and it's curtailing supply to a point where we're actually going to see uh, prices go up anytime soon. So, so I see where he's coming from. And I see that in the sense that um, there is a large oversupply today relative to demand today um, for oil and gas. And so even though there's a similar effect for oil um, versus you know some of the other commodities that he's talking about in terms of capital starvation leading to disappointing supply, um, you really need demand to come back at least to some extent to um, to get the benefit of it for oil. So if you don't think that air travel is going to recover for a few years, if you don't think people are going to be driving again and commuting to work or whatever, um, then you probably don't want to own oil because there's plentiful oil in inventories and there's plentiful available supply currently between, um, you know, uh, OECD countries as well as uh, OPEC uh, production that's been curtailed. So, so there is you do need demand to come back to some extent, um, and for many other commodities, demand has come back at least to some extent. Like China's like building a whole bunch of roads to nowhere and bridges and whatever other like cities that are empty. Um, so, th- so iron ore and steel and uh, met coal and certain other things are rebounding on the back of that in a way that oil isn't because oil is, I guess, more tied to real economic activity. Um, but you, you do need that demand to, um, to soak up uh, some of the excess supply that's just driven by uh, you know, a decade plus of investment anticipating higher demand levels for oil production. And, and- isn't the longer that this continues in terms of oil demand not returning, won't that just mean a higher price on the other side? Because doesn't this mean in the long run less supply as companies cut back on their exploration and as less investors allocate capital to this uh, sector? Yeah, so, so there, there is like, I guess, kind of like a coiled spring type mechanism from a supply perspective. I mean, there had been a bubble of investment in oil and gas even after the oil price crash in 2014, where private equity funds and insurance companies and bond uh, purchasers were funding um, the aggressive development of newfound or newly economic, I guess everyone kind of knew it was there, um, newly supposedly economic shale resources across North America. And so you had this kind of capital investment bubble, which has burst for oil. And so you have oil production down by a few million barrels a day across North America. Um, And then across the world, you're seeing wholly insufficient capital investment. Um, You know, offshore rigs, the offshore rig count is near uh, multi-decade low. Um, There's underinvestment across OPEC. There's underinvestment across most other oil producing countries and regions. So yeah, I mean, eventually you'll see this catch up and it'll be brutal. You just do need demand. Like it'll take a few years for oil production to fall to the current oil demand level. So you do need some demand to come back for oil prices to really get interesting. The flip side is that it's going to be extremely difficult to get the oil demand or sorry, oil supply growth train back on the tracks. And so the longer it takes, the more 
uh, drilling rigs get cannibalized or sold for scrap, um, the more pressure pumping, so like what you need to frack wells that are from unconventional resources, the more of that equipment gets cannibalized as well, uh, used for spare parts and so on. The fewer offshore rigs will be around that'll be stacked in any sort versus just being scrapped as well. And, and then from a people perspective, lots of people are leaving the industry and you know there's uh, still demand for engineers and for programmers and so on. So a lot of the jobs, um, a lot of the skill sets that have been built up to help manage oil and gas companies or help you know do engineering or whatever are applicable to other sectors as well. And so there are people leaving. So to try to get activity back up again, you're gonna need higher prices for a long time to incentivize uh, capital and to incentivize people to choose to come back to work in the sector. So I'd like to explore one thing there that you mentioned, um, this supposedly profitable um, fracking, and I could almost hear the air quotes there as you said supposedly. Why don't you talk to us about what you think happened there and what investors got wrong and maybe why that, why that occurred? That's a great question. I mean, there was like a, a set of uh, things happening kind of simultaneously. So there was bad governance at the public company side where public companies felt this like urge and they were rewarded by bond investors as well as by public equity uh, speculators. Um, they felt an urge when like the Eagleford became hot to go buy a bunch of land in the Eagleford and then when the Bakken got hot to go buy a bunch of land up in North Dakota. And then uh, when Midland Basin got hot in the Permian in West Texas to go lease land there, and then um, in the Delaware Basin in New Mexico and further West Texas to go do the same thing. So there was kind of this like motivation for public equity, for public companies to do things that weren't necessarily return maximizing. And then that behavior fueled a even kind of more aggressive speculative bubble on the private side where many companies went and leased land they thought public companies or larger private companies would want to buy from them and then drilled wells to try to prove it up and then flip it to other private companies or to those public companies. So there was a lot of kind of speculative activity driven by low interest rates, driven by uh, you know, spec bad governance on the public equity side, as well as um, you know, speculative activity by um, equity and and uh, bond investors. And so there were a lot of wells that were drilled that were never intended to be economic in and of themselves. The idea was to prove up resource and then resell to um, kind of like a hot potato sort of thing. Right. So now we have a situation where we have this huge amount of supply. We have COVID. It's kind of like the worst of all worlds. As I mentioned, there's a lot of selling occurring in this industry. Let's start picking through. Why don't you just talk to us about what sort of companies that you're looking to buy in this kind of disaster zone of energy investing? Sure. So, uh, the most important thing for things that I own and things that I'm buying is that they're not likely to go bankrupt anytime soon if things stay really bad, because uh, it's important to have survivability uh, to be able to benefit from, you know, if the if you're pressing down on a coiled spring and then the spring breaks, uh, it doesn't help that you press down really, really, really hard. Um, so survivability is very important. And then it's also important that the company actually um, is a coiled spring. So um, people are excited about, you mentioned XLE as an index, like the oil majors, but their shares were trading at giant premiums to their intrinsic values, um, partly because there had been a boom in refining profits because there had been this kind of irrational uh, speculative bubble in unconventional shale development. And so that that kind of overinvestment in that particular resource allowed refiners to over earn and to ex experience some of their best years in decades. Um, and oil majors have large components of their, um, of, you know, of, of, of their businesses as refining and as chemical processing and so on. And so those portions of their businesses over earned. And now as activity is coming down, their 
under earning or they're you know kind of back to being kind of junky businesses you know, these are businesses that make all their money in a few years and then no money for like 20 or 30 years and so um I think it's also important to make sure that the things that I'm buying or that I'm considering buying aren't like that, like didn't just have a few good years and then, you know, conflating uh, upstream assets that are, are you know, compressed, uh, you know, deeply coiled multiple years of like really difficult times versus, you know, throwing in refining assets or other sorts of assets that are just now starting to have trouble um, are, are pretty different. So, so just like, uh, I guess, some clarification or like where I'm looking and, um, you know, there, there are some crazy things that majors, or at least they look crazy things that the oil majors are doing that actually have very little to do with uh, a down, down cycle in upstream oil and gas. So is XLE almost not the, the, the let's just say, the ETF that you want to be watching if you're interested in this industry? Like, is it XOP or is there something else that you watch that would be more... Yeah, so- so from an ETF perspective, the ones that I watch or like, you know, consider in, in measuring my funds performance or measuring, you know, how something is is doing would be yeah, like an XOP or even like a PSCE, which is kind of like a small cap producers index. Um, and, and not that I'm, I'm certainly not recommending any of these ETFs, but just like in terms of the composition, like the oil majors and super majors are having a really rough time and they started from a high point of valuation. Um, and they started from a point where people have been bidding up dividend paying stocks. Um, there's like different kind of terms for it, like dividend heroes or whatever it is where they've like raised their dividends every year for decades. And so they were beneficiaries of that and got to valuations that were, um, way out of line with their underlying assets. And now that they're having some problems with some of those assets, um, you know, that there's actually, there's like a big air pocket. Where, where their valuations might actually still have a lot more room to, to come down. So you're looking at for companies that have survivability, but yet also have some torque, I guess, on the upside. Do you have any names that will, you know, fit the bill that we can talk about? Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, one that I actually haven't really talked that much about before, I'm happy to you know share with you and, and uh, um, your listeners is a company in Canada called Tamarack Valley. Okay. That's T V E in Canada. T- Thomas Victor right. Edward. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this company? So so I've known them for a long time and their CEO is the former head of Apache Canada, back when that meant something. Um and um he grew their business and managed a billion dollar plus annual budget for them. And he went out on his own and founded or co-founded Tamarack a number of years ago as a small public company. And um, he's been just slowly and steadily chipping away, uh, trying to grow the business profitably, um, drilling some of the best wells in Canada repeatedly, and making smart, longer-term oriented acquisitions that frequently leave people puzzled, often send his share price down a whole lot for a while. And then two or three or five years later, people look at it and are like, oh, wow, that was like brilliant. And what a great deal he did and so on. So um, followed him for a long time, have owned the stock previously, and then um, got involved again in um, the past year or so and heavily involved since the stock crashed post COVID because they have a strong balance sheet and They've made some interesting uh, strides on their assets that don't seem to be priced in at all. Okay. And so where are the assets? Oh, sorry. So they're in uh, uh, southwestern Alberta. Okay. um, And they have a little bit in um, Saskatchewan as well, um, but predominantly um, southern Alberta. Um, They're... Cardium is kind of southwestern Alberta. The Viking uh, formation that they're active in is kind of uh, southeastern Alberta, and it, it kind of gets close up to the Saskatchewan border. And is it all is it is it oil or is there gas in there too? Uh, they're about like sixty forty oil and gas. Okay. Um, they they actually have um, a number of uh, gas uh, drilling targets. 
that they could go after, and uh, they may actually end up drilling some gas wells in the next 12 months, just given how much gas prices have gone up versus oil in the last six months. Now, I'm just having a quick look at their balance sheet and uh, pulling it up on the Bloomberg. I see that they do have some loans outstanding, but they actually have credit for an extra $160 million. Like, this is a small company, right? They have $94 million of loans and uh, an extra room for another $160. If I, am I reading that right? Um, I'd have to look at their balance sheet again to, to get the exact numbers. But yeah, they're, they, they have a strong balance sheet. They have available credit capacity. And one of the interesting things that's happened is um, we were kind of talking about this earlier at a high level. Um, as uh, oil prices have, uh, you know, as they crashed because of COVID and have stayed low because of kind of excess supply worldwide as you know, airlines haven't, uh, you know, people haven't started flying again and so on. Um, many of Tamarack's competitors, including some companies that I own stock in, um, have reset their production levels far lower right now versus where they were a year ago. Okay. And one of the things that Tamarack has done very well in an acquisition they did a few years ago that everyone thought they were crazy for doing is they bought assets that were very high decline rate and they changed them. They started a water flood, um, which is probably one of the least sexy possible terms for oil and gas or kind of in general, but they basically inject water into these reservoirs that they've drilled horizontal wells into and they get more oil coming out and that oil produces at a very steady rate and will likely produce at around that rate for a number of years. So they take an asset that required a lot of capital to develop initially and people think would require a lot of capital to sustain and they take it from a high sustaining obligation to a low sustaining obligation sort of situation. So when I'm listening to you, you're really getting in the weeds, like a true kind of uh, getting uh, almost can picture you out there on the on the fields, uh, getting your hands dirty. And it looks like you're picking people that you view as smarter than the rest of them. I, I was wondering, in general, what's your impression of most management? Like, do you think that this is he's this uh, this manager for Tamarack is is truly outstanding and is delivering alpha, whereas most of them are actually costing uh the shareholders money? Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess I was kind of saying that with the exec comp stuff, but yeah, I mean, I think in general, um, management teams, there's like a Peter principle to some extent, like people get promoted to their position of maximum incompetence. Um, <laughs> so generally companies are not well run. Boards are not well appointed. Um, I, I joined a board of another Canadian public company actually a few years ago uh, that was on a bad trajectory and ended up replacing the board and management team and selling the company and um, actually earned a profit from that while their peers uh, active in that same area that was kind of uh, uh, a little bit further north and all the way towards the border with British Columbia in Alberta um, while the peers were down about 50% or so their, their share prices in that time frame, And we actually were able to sell the company for a profit. So yeah, I think there's things you can do differently. And if you're different enough over a long enough period of time, you should be able to compound value. But I think that's the exception, not the rule. So one of the things I don't want to mention the company, but there was a company you and I were talking about and uh, you, you found management to be uh not forthcoming and, and, and you weren't, you weren't hugely impressed yet. This is one of those names that is well loved within the Canadian oil patch community. What do you think's going on? Are, are we as Canadians just more prone to, to falling for this? Or do you think this is in, in all companies in, in all industries? Yeah, I don't think it's a Canadian special thing. I mean, I think like, <laughs> You know, you could say this about politics too, right? Is Canada poorly governed? Sure. Is the U.S. poorly governed? Sure. Like, you know, it's not, I don't think there's like a, a specialness. Like it, it is something I will say, like Canada at least has somewhat some semblance of rule of law, unlike, you know, certain third world countries where you really just, it's hard to do business. So it's like a reason that I'll invest as an American in Canada versus maybe not in like Argentina or sub-Saharan Africa or whatever. Um, so, so I think there, are, you know, there are the good things, which is that there, there are at least some of the laws are, are obeyed and enforced. Um, and so that part's good. Um, but from a governance perspective, I think just generally 
the way that we set up companies, the governance rules that are in place, and the economic incentives for managements and boards are broadly flawed and yield results that you would expect from flawed incentives. And do you think that uh, that investors fall for this too often, like the fall for a good story? Like, you know, is, is it something where we get crowded into good stories and, and that's where your real edge is, is, is avoiding those and, and finding the down and outs things that people aren't really paying attention to? Uh, yeah, maybe over like a multi-year perspective. I mean, like as you were, you were saying that, I was thinking of, you know, examples outside of oil and gas. So, you know, a, a Netflix or a Zoom or I don't know, one of these things where, you know, they're not badly run, um, but their business models aren't really sustainable, at least relative to their equity valuations. And, you know, I'm not, I'm just focused on oil and gas from a, a professional investment perspective, but I can observe kind of valuations that make no sense for business models like a Netflix where their obligations to go buy additional content to, you know, feed their, their viewers, um, you know, the cost, the inflation there versus the ability to charge their uh, subscribers more money, there's like a disconnect. And so um, I don't think it's special to oil and gas. I just think that oil and gas has had a particularly long cyclical downturn. And so it's exposed some of these governance and management issues more than other sectors. Got it. Okay. So let's go through some other names that you like. Anything sure. else? So um, another name that I like that um, that uh, Cuppy may have talked about, I can't remember, is uh, Sandridge Energy. And yep. that's in the US, the stock ticker is SD. Right. Okay. So why don't you walk us through the story of why you like this one? And, and uh, full disclosure, I do own it. And like, Tamarack, I may buy or sell it at any time and so on. Um, so Sandridge um, is a restructured company. Uh, they had been started um, by, well, kind of started by Tom Ward, run by him for a while. Um, they were focused on a number of different assets that uh, were not highly successful. They borrowed lots of money. Um, and they ended up with a giant bet on Oklahoma, on northern Oklahoma, southern Kansas, on a formation that had been around for decades called the Mississippi Line. And um, ultimately, Tom got fired because uh, the shareholders were upset about how he spent their money. And they replaced him with someone who spent their money even worse and bankrupted the company. And then um, post reorg, uh, new management was brought in and they also were awful and Carl Icahn got involved because they were so awful and then he <laughs> brought in someone even worse and eventually they have someone in place who looks like he's pretty competent who you know I've connected with a little bit and you know he's basically just dedicated to stopping losing money um, and you know this is a stock that obviously went to zero uh, going into the bankruptcy and then now is down over 90% from its emergence share price. So, you know, it's uh, compounded down, you know, 100% plus down 90 or 95 or something percent. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, and everyone knows about it and everyone hates it, even though they don't even know who's running it or what the assets are or what the valuation is or anything. And so um, that's actually like a great setup, I think, for finding something that's extremely undervalued and promising. So Sandridge is a lot of nat gas, and even though we're sitting here talking about oil and the demand for oil is causing it to slump, I'm pulling up the 12-month strip on nat gas. I see it actually pushed to a new high today. What do you think is your outlook for nat gas, uh, in, and what do you think that means for the companies? So, so Bison, as a, a firm, we've actually started putting out these like white papers on specific areas and specific things that are happening that we think are really interesting and poorly understood. So like earlier on in COVID, we put out something on suburbanization and, um, you know, we observed that people were leaving cities and some of those people are unlikely to return. And this could be a demand factor that was positive for oil, because if you move to the suburbs or you move to Colorado or whatever, you're going to be driving a lot more and you're probably not driving an electric car. And so, um, we put out something somewhat recently on what's happening in West Texas from a natural gas supply perspective, and we're working on something on mid the Midcon right now, the area that Sandridge is active in. And what we're seeing is that natural gas supply was being driven to a large extent 
by oil-oriented drilling in West Texas. And as that drilling has slowed down dramatically, uh, we're seeing associated gas that came with the, that oil that people were drilling for, uh, we're seeing that production fall off a lot. And so the kind of Henry Hub price, so the kind of North American price for natural gas is up, but also the local prices are up a lot. And that tells us that um, there's a really attractive supply demand situation uh, for natural gas that's likely to sustain actually for a while. Well, that's terrific. So where can people find these white papers? How do they go about uh, downloading them? Uh, just on my website, d- bisoninterest.com. Bisoninterest.com. So listen, we're running guys uh, short on time. It's It's been a pleasure having you on, Josh. Why don't you tell people, uh, do, are you on Twitter or no? Are you Are you smarter than that? <laughs> no, I'm not that active. I'll occasionally just, you know, uh, retweet a white paper or something like that. But yeah, I mean, the best way to find me is just, you know, on my website, email me or whatever. And, you know, I appreciate the the time. And just I'll, I'll give Sam Ridge another 30 seconds. It's at like trailing less than one times EBITDA. And they just sold the office building that people didn't realize they owned. And they're going to pay off almost all their debt just with the proceeds of their office building. So it's, uh, you know, there was kind of this like, ramble about natural gas and the the situation uh, on my part but you know as a company it's super interesting and tom ward way back in the day bought all this land that sandbridge still has a lot of rights to and the problem was that drilling costs were high and natural gas prices were low and we're now in a situation where natural gas prices are rising and drilling costs are falling and so it's this very interesting setup um that that I think people will find interesting if they can get over the distaste for the name and the memories of bad management. <laughs> well, that's terrific. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us today, Josh. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. It's our pleasure to welcome back to the show, Brent Kochuba from Spot Gamma. And he's here to give us a special election day update. Brent, welcome back. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the chance to talk to you about this. It's uh, very exciting for me. Yeah, so awesome. you were telling us that uh, we were asking how things are going, and you were mentioning that everyone loves Gamma now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's gotten very, very, very popular. It's, um, the, you know what? It was, the, it was the SoftBank thing that just made it sort of you know, uh, mainstream news, uh, you know, literally. And so after that, you know, everyone wants to know what, what Gamma is, and suddenly it's you know, dr- just driving everything. Uh, which has been right. fascinating. And now the trendy new thing is Vanna, which is something we could talk about, I guess, a little bit here. But um, Yeah, before uh, we get to that, why don't we go about the thing you brought to, to our attention? You made this great presentation about how this election differs from the previous election and what this might mean both to the markets and the option market. So why don't you walk us through? Let's start with this slide called the setup. Yeah, so what I did in this is I wanted to look at the options position before big previous events. And one is actually just the event of the 2016 election. I remember going into that election, that volatility was very, very high. Um, and, you know, it typically is before elections. Um, and obviously the futures on the night of the election, you know, the movement that night and then kind of the few days after was very wild. Um, you know, until Hillary sort of conceded the election, we were getting kind of these two, 3% moves. Uh, you know, obviously the night of when Trump won, futures went limit down and then had this really vicious rebound. Uh, but the volatility, which you can kind of see in that red line, kind of settled in. So like the week of, it felt very crazy. And then after that, the market just kind of started lifting off um, and going higher. And, you know, I thought that was a very interesting reaction when I think back about the way that options seem to control the market now. And so I compared that election period in terms of SPX options and, that, and you know, the big S&Ps versus um, today's election setup. And then also I looked at the 2018 crash uh, and I looked at the 2018 crash because we're going into December now, obviously. And the biggest positions every year in terms of SP op- S&P options is in December. Every year it's the biggest, you know, there's year end hedges that are always there. And so I thought that was kind of relevant to the situation now. And then I also just did a little synopsis of the 2020, you know, COVID crash position just to, for some more comparisons. Uh, just a quick question uh, on that December paper. Is it uh, the typical third Friday or do people yep. use the end of year one, the December 31st? Typical, typical third Friday. There's still okay. some decent in the, in the 
31st, but typical third Friday is where the meat of it is. Right. Okay. Right. So let's go and let's go through this this uh, graph or this chart that you showed that uh, shows the elections going back to 1928. Wow. Yeah. So this is from uh, from Dow Jones market data. Uh, I got through the the Wall Street Journal, kind of tweeted this out, and I thought it was interesting. And you know, I was preparing my presentation for this for this week, and I had to keep kind of adjusting things because you know the market just got beat up pretty pretty big here. And so what this chart shows is, and I think this is two days old now, that this is the biggest pre-election drawdown, you know, meaning the week into the elections that we've ever seen. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is also the most options driven market that we've ever seen. You know, we, we monitor market gamma and gamma went negative on uh, last week. We crossed 3,400, which is kind of our flip point. And, and for those of you who aren't too familiar with this topic, it means that when gamma goes negative, the market starts to go down. We think dealers need to start selling futures. And the other thing that's compounded with is, as you know, as we get every day towards the election, more and more puts are added, right? More people add hedges. And so what happens when people buy puts? Well, dealers are short puts and they got a short future. So I don't think this drawdown, you know, there's some people are saying second lockdown of COVID and, you know, we're, we're changing based on Trump's odds or Biden's odds. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think people are buying puts and so the market's natural drift is lower, right? I mean, big funds, no one's making big macro decisions right now to step up and buy any stocks. I think this is just the mechanical drawdown of just the options position in a low liquidity environment. Um, you know, I think just 500,000 puts were added this week in the S&P. So, you know, people are hedging, they're buying puts and the market's kind of just, unfortunately, kind of a, you know, it's a tail wagging the dog kind of thing. I'm actually shocked that uh, people are buying puts this late because it's not like this wasn't uh, known for a long time. Yeah. You, well, you know, I was thinking about that myself and, you know, now you, you have the weekly options and, you, you know, there's so many kind of day traders or people with short term views, but there are thing that's kind of funny about it is that, you know, if you bought puts last week, you know, when the market was at 3450 or something, now we've moved down six, 7%. I mean, you want to roll those down and out? Do you want to change your bet or how you're positioned? If you think vol is going to come, come off a lot, you know, right after the election, which is a common um, view, you know, so I almost wonder if you hedge it too early, you know, depending on, or if you try to short it too early or whatever it is that your position is not going to be kind of way off, maybe from the, from the risk metrics that you want to have. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how, right. you, how you think about that, but. Um, yeah, no, that's a good uh, point. So let's go to yeah. this next slide, which is the put options in the setup into the 2016 election. So we yeah. want you to walk us through what was happening there. Sure. So this shows the VIX and the S&P in terms of options, open interest. And so you can see that on both the VIX puts and calls, obviously volume in terms of total open interest increases quite a bit. The VIX call options have a much larger spike in terms of the amount of uh, new positions added. So again, people are hedging into the 2016 election, just like they're hedging here, uh, which I, what I think is probably a bit more interesting maybe in this election is that, you know, in, in October, and we have a slide that will talk about this in a second, you know, people started saying short vol is maybe the trade of a lifetime. We'll talk about that in a second. But just the natural mechanics in 2016 is, you know, we're going to buy puts into this election. You know, we're going to hedge ourselves into, you know, the movement or the volatility of this election. It was fascinating about it too is that Hillary had it wrapped up, you know, last year. And so people were still hedging that event uh, as people like to hedge events. Um, and the unwind was initially very violent and then, you know, pretty calm. Um, which I am not so sure is, you know, similar thing is going to happen this time. Uh, but, but basically these slides show that, look, you know, every day people hedge more and more and more. And so, you know, we have Monday, which will probably have some more hedges added. Uh, and then, you know, Tuesday is kind of the big event. Right, right, right. So this just sort of sets the stage for comparison. You can see, you know, how people operate. And again, you know, every day this week we added puts. And so 500,000 S&P puts were added just this week. So back to this idea you know, in early October, it was really funny because the S&P was over 3,400. Stocks seemed to be rebounding, doing pretty well. Um, and there was a litany of headlines for why that was. And, and there was this article that went around that the election volatility short is the trade of a lifetime. And regardless of outcome, volatility is going to decline. And a lot of people, yeah. there was this VIX one by two trader, you know, that made headlines because he was putting on just this massive VIX short position. And people are basically betting that by December, January, you know, volatility and the volatility curve and term structure is going to deflate. And, you know, they're going to make a whole bunch of money because we're going to get a blue sweep and the market's just going to kind of breathe a sigh of relief and, and we're going to move on with life. Um, and I think kind of in the last week, you know, 
that maybe has gotten shaken up a little bit. I will say that there was still pretty heavy VIX call buying this week. Uh, I think just yesterday or two days ago, we, we noted that um, VIX call options were trading on a 1.6 ratio, which is kind of this, that segment is, is highs of the last four or five years, meaning people are buying way more puts than calls kind of into the face of this drawdown here, still betting on this volatility collapse. Right. So Brent, just full disclosure, I was one of those idiots that was saying election <laughs> volatility. I didn't say it was as short of a lifetime, but I definitely <laughs> could, thought I definitely thought that right. I, yeah, I saw that trade the one by two and I liked it and I put it on and uh, I, I'm missing a face now. Um, <laughs> but anyways, let's <laughs> We were we were just talking about this. Uh, you know, what what if you put the trade on too early? You know what I mean? And oh, and maybe yeah. it's still a great trade. And so I think you just got to kind of double down. You know? Well, uh, I I actually did add to it because it, the thing about it is, if you do the one by twos in the options, the reality is as it's moved away, you're actually become less short. Right. So you're naturally you have some you have some gamma on your on your VIX position. So you have the ability to add to it if you're if you're thinking about it from that perspective. So let's yeah, talk about this next chart here that you have the VIX gamma set up. What, what's this showing? So what this is showing is basically, this is as of Thursday, kind of where all the big VIX positions are are relative to kind of what we were just talking about. So the, yeah. the 40 strike is the highest call open interest in, in VIX. And then to the downside, it's actually the 20 strike, which is the most popular put strike. And so what we end up with, not surprisingly, is this, is that the 30 is where our model kind of picks up that is the, the kind of bull bear line, right? So if we break 30 in VIX, there's going to be a flush real quick, you know, kind of flush down lower. Um, and obviously, you know, we had we lost another 2% in the market here today, uh, or excuse me, over the last couple of days. Um, but, the, but the picture has really changed such that November saw a lot of call buying in the VIX. And I think what they're doing is they're buying calls in November and then shorting or buying puts out in December or January, um, such that now also when the VIX went up through 40, that really kind of started to shift the, uh, the, the most valuable strike to the 40 strike in, in VIX, because again, the VIX went up to 40. And so that's kind of given a little more juice to that 40 line in the upper end of the VIX. Meaning if things kind of go a little bit sideways or they don't go expected on elections, you know, this thing is really primed to kind of, you know, fall apart pretty quickly meaning the market could could really uh fall apart pretty quickly um and vice versa you know we're going to get a quick probably move down to 30 but under 30 i think that you know this whole volatility sort of term structure deflates very quickly and you get kind of the snap snap back rally at this point um and probably see a quick move to 3600 so it's 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 primed which is again not terribly surprising but when we show where the put distribution is in a few slides i think it'll make a little more sense and and queue up but if you look at just yeah. this week, uh, two days ago, we had 500,000 puts to 180,000 calls trading the VIX. Uh, the next day wow. was 245,000 puts to 160,000 calls. And then the day after that was 465,000 puts to 280 calls. So you could just see that the the put to call ratio is is stacked. So people are really pushing into this you know, volatility, decompression or deflation bet. Okay, so what do we got here? Is the election the event or the trigger? Right. So in this article, it was kind of interesting. You know, they were talking about shorting, you know, that the election is the event. And I think if the election goes as expected, and I know both of you guys are, well, you maybe had different views on who's going to win, um, that if Biden wins and it's a blue sweep, then I think the election is just kind of the event, right? That it goes with what everyone's sort of models are forecasting, uh, or what the sort of the common narrative is, is right now, that means we're going to get stimulus. And, you know, so the market's just going to go higher. I think that's, from what I've seen, is the general kind of consensus. And Obive put out some research kind of saying that. And basically anything outside of that adds to the uncertainty, right? So if 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 there's a, the electoral college is not clear who who's won, or the popular vote in the electoral college will go the same way, or there's any kind of messiness in the clarity of the election, then I think there's a trigger of events, right? Does Biden just say, okay, fine, Donald, you won, or vice versa, and or, you know, if it's a long, drawn out conclusion, then there's probably a series of events that happen, right? I mean, God only knows what could go on, you know, after this election, if things aren't, if there's not a clear winner decided, right? And so, maybe the election is just the trigger of another series of events that take place, 
for any other outcome than Biden is a decisive and overwhelming victory. You're getting me worried, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, look, me I mean, let's be honest. If, it, if it's a blue, if it's a blue sweep and the market, you know, it's not t- terribly interesting. Right. And, and no one's probably going to play this back. But if it's anything but the blue sweep, then people are going to, you know, that that's what's the interesting case is, I, I think. Maybe OK, so, so let's go look at this October 20th current snapshot of the of the market. And, and what does it tell us? Yeah. So what's so interesting to me about this, and we have the 2016 distribution, the 2016 distribution, which you'll see in a few slides, is, is, a, is a very normal distribution. And this distribution is much more spread out, right? The, the Where we are now, there are a lot of big put positions from essentially the 3200 strike all the way down to the 2000 strike. And I think this distribution is much wider than normal because of the COVID crash earlier this year that it probably skewed where people were placing their hedging bets for the end of the year, right? When the S&P was down around 3,000 and hanging around there, trading a buying tail risk at that point was, you know, 2,600 strike, right? And so you may have bought puts for that and now the market's up around 32 or 3,300 and so your tail risk or 20% down or however you want to measure that is, you know, up around 3,000, right? So it's, it's changed the... Where the puts are placed, I think it's changed so much because of the volatility in the market. So, you know, for those of you statistic sort of people, it's a it's a platycurtic distribution, right? It's very it's very spread out over the over all the various strikes from basically fifteen hundred strike all the way up to four thousand. Okay, so y- you get a, a medal there because I've never heard that before. Uh, <laughs> when you said it, I, it sounded like plat- platypus or something. The platypus distribution. <laughs> what what does that so, mean? Where did you dig that one up? Well, like if you have the norm, if you have like a normal distribution, like the bell curve, and you just yep. like squash the bell curve down, yep. you know, you can see that the that this is not really a curve, right? It's almost like a straight line where all of these strikes have at least a hundred thousand contracts from fifteen fifteen hundred strike all the way up to the you know uh, thirty five hundred thirty six hundred strikes. So, so, so Brent, what is it, what does that mean in your mind? Like, does that mean that uh, the volatility can accelerate if uh, if we start getting wider moves? Like, how, how do you interpret this? So, I so I think what it is is like when you had a very normal distribution, or when all this when all the puts are concentrated around the at the money, it kind of chains volatility to the at the money a little bit more, right? Because you don't have that extra put positioning lower that helps to draw the market down or or push dealers to have to keep shorting futures to hedge themselves. In this case, just like this past week, once we broke 3,400, there's a ton of puts at 3,350. There's even more puts at 3,300, at 3,250. There's more and and so on. So every time we draw down a little more, it catches, you know, the the next put strike kind of catches the market and, and reels it down because dealers need to keep shorting futures. And this distribution is something that is something that shows in December 2018 drawdown as well as the the uh, 2000 and the, the COVID crash and this wider distribution of puts means I think that the volatility is fueled as the market goes lower. Whereas when all the when the concentration of options is kind of at the money, you lose a little bit of that fuel. Right, the the market is a little more tethered to that at the money strike, even if it draws down. Whereas in this case. Where is it going to tether to if it picks up another hundred thousand or one hundred fifty thousand puts every fifty or twenty five handles that goes lower? If that if that makes sense, right? So basically, so, strap on your seatbelts, right? Well, you, you know, and that well, that works on the way up too. I think you know, yeah. there, the, the call option position is not the same at the moment, but what happens after if it's a clean election and people like the outcome and they're going to get stimulus is all those puts are going to burn. The VIX is going to collapse, and this is the Vanna trade that everyone talks about. You know, implied ball comes down and the short puts or excuse me, all those long put positions get crushed. So dealers who are short puts, now they got to start buying futures. We know, you know, everybody knows what, how to buy tech calls these days and what that does to the market. And so I think you get just an incredible, you can just get an incredible rally off the back of this. But really the point is that the way that the options are positioned, the way that people are using options is that the volatility, you, you can't just have like this slow trending market anymore, right? It's going to be either, a real sharp drawdown or a real, you know, rapid, you know, snap, snap, rally, snap back rally up to the 3,600 area because of the options mechanic and the mechanics of the options hedging uh, and the way that people are using options now. So do you want to take a shot at uh, explaining Vanna? I, I wrote yeah, a piece so- about it and I, I made plenty of Vanna white jokes, but that's not what we're talking <laughs> about. So why don't you go ahead, Brandon? I'll let you do it. Yeah, so short short puts and long calls have what's 
what's called van a positive van and all that all it is is telling you is that if the if vol, as volatility goes down that is measuring vanna measures as implied volatility goes down how much change in delta there's going to be so if if implied vol goes down dealers who are short puts are going to be able to buy back futures right because puts right. are worth less money Right. right. So if you, you have an at the money put for all is equal, when vol collapses, your put loses money. So the amount of hedges that I need to hedge that put, that short put as a dealer, changes. Right. I need less futures, less short futures. So I just buy them back as vol goes down. So to, to explain that in, in another way is if if the market is unchanged from the election, mm -hmm. yet all the dealers go and move their pricing that they're hedging, the, the volatility pricing that they're hedging at down then they would be f short futures and have to buy them back, even though right. nothing nothing's changed in the delta. Meaning that even if the price of the actual underline doesn't change, if they change the the level at which they're hedging down lower, then that actually causes a positive purchase of futures. Right. Yes, it changes the delta of the option. Right. So if you if you look at all these puts that are from you know three thousand on down, right? If we get any kind of a market positive reaction to whatever the outcome is all of those puts down there and there's you know two million puts that are tied to the december expiration right now those are all going to lose value overnight right just like an earnings play in you know all these guys that like to short options and earnings because after earnings vol crash vol crashes and so you can either play about trying to short vix or you could short s p options right you can short puts particularly in s p because it's going to be the same mechanics right when vol drops the the value of that put drops you know you and almost on top of that you get the decay the decay factor as the, we move into yeah. december right uh, the decay is usually uh it causes a, a grind higher like a, as people as the decays lower they actually have to hedge less again and so they're buying back their futures that they're short against them right the puts, right and, right? and right that's that that's exactly right so that that's where i sort of feel like what for example that that first slide where we talked about while well, all the market's down you know kind of a Cool, pre-election record amount like i don't think that has anything to do with the i mean it is a contested election everyone says oh it's the most important election of a lifetime blah 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 but the point is is that because so many options are bought now in the mechanics of the market i think that you just have you can't just have a flat market anymore like there, there's too much going on in terms of option land which forces dealers to react one way forces dealers to hedge one way or the other right they they there's no more. It's like a shark. It's got to keep swimming, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. That's a great line. I like that. But you know what? I, I'm always a little bit uh, too optimistic because I sit there and watch it. And all I can think about is if it's not the end of the world and we do move our vols down, then the amount of buying is going to be monstrous. So let's go to yeah. your next uh, slide here. Put placements. Yeah, so th this just breaks down in, in straight terms, you know, what the what the put what the options placement is again in, of the S and P. And what's so fascinating to me is in talks that distribution is the percent that's 20% or greater out of the money uh, on the put side. So you can see the percent of options that's greater than 20% of the money, both for the COVID crash and the October, you know, where we are right now is 50% or greater. Whereas in 2018, excuse me, and in 2016, it was only 30%. So that's a slight, it seems like, you know, 10%, but that equates to quite a bit of options, right? So we have 6.2 million total put options right now in the S&P. Uh, and what's fascinating is that is the same number of puts that was in the October 2016 election period. The difference is, as I mentioned before, the distribution is much different, right? There's a right. lot more betting on 20% or greater out of the money. And so I think that causes, again, if the market does draw down, you're going to, you're going to get hedging, which is going to help push that market lower. Because the other interesting thing is that the December options, by and large, won't get closed until expiration. People hold them to expiration. And so if you look at the 2018 crash in December, do you guys know, and I think I've mentioned this before on the show, so maybe you know what the answer is, but do you guys know what the low was the day of the low in December of 2018? I can't remember. You mean that that uh, Christmas know? Eve morning? Yeah. Christmas, Eve, Christmas Eve. So the yeah, day yeah. before, that was a Monday, and the, the day before... That was the Friday, third Friday expiration, which two, uh, okay. two, two point some odd million puts expired on that Friday. The following Monday was a big drawdown. And I know I talked about this, but do you know, well, I guess obviously you probably can name the, name the day. Uh, the March low of 2020 was, was a it? Monday and the right after the. 
the right low after, was the third fire. That, when all the, I mean, we had hundreds of thousands of in the money puts expiring in both situations. And so the other thing that's so fascinating to me about this is like, let's say, okay, you know, the market moves on and everything is peachy keen after the election. That's fine. But what's so interesting on the drawdown is if I, I picking a price is kind of tough, but I can maybe pick a, a day of what the low could possibly be based on, you know, some of these big moves. So you have, 2.6 million puts as of two days ago, I think, uh, for December that are going to, you know, come off the books, right? And obviously people are going to adjust hedges, but let's say it's just 2 million puts are going to expire in December, uh, which is what that first one month put OI is. Uh, it's poorly labeled. I apologize for that. Um, so it's 2.6 million December puts options are going to expire on the third Friday this year. Right. Third Friday, December. But don't, don't um, we see sometimes when it's going the other way and when we get that, um, do we see a situation, though, um, Brent, when sometimes when the market's been rallying that the actual highs end up being the expiry? Yeah, it, it, well, it's the same function, right? Yeah. Are, are people long calls or long puts? And then how's the market reacting to that? And, and so, you know, just like anything else, if you can figure out how the biggest counterparty is positioned or how they're going to react or what they're going to do, you know, then you can maybe take the other side of that. So, you know, there's no doubt, like in August, that there was just you know, I have a chart of this. It's the, the amount of retail buying in, in August and of options, you, the amount of call premium they spent in August is just mind blowing. If you look at that chart and all that expired and came off. And so there's no, you know, there's no doubt that that 10% correction that we had in September was tied to, you know, this option to unwind. Right. Right. And so I think that's the kind of situation you're talking about. And so in that same vein, you know, unfortunately, or, or maybe not, unfortunately, I think a lot of people pay, play the tech calls on weeklies and sort of shorter term views. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen once, you know, if, if the market decides that the election outcome is bullish, I think that, you know, we do see just a very rapid, quick ramp higher. The call position is still big, you know, 1.5 million calls are in December right now. Uh, but I think you're right in that you could just also see the same thing, right? If, if the market gets this convex move higher and all those calls are closed out in December, you know, then maybe you get sort of a, a, a correction, um, you know, something akin to like what we had in August and into September. Right. So let's go through the next slides here. You have the October 2016 option positions, and this is resembling that bell curve that you. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, this no is the bell curve. so you can see how you can see how the distribution is quite a bit different. Right. And so that means that as it moves away from the strikes that the majority of the open interest is in, it becomes less extra gamma, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly, exactly. There's not the fuel there is not the same. And this this slide you're looking at now is December 2018. And so you know some things change structurally in the market. You know the 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 addition of the weekly options really kind of started in 2016 and just really picked up after that. Um, and so you know that's something that the market has to sort of contend with now that's a little bit different obviously the use of options overall is much much bigger now um not necessarily in the s p but also i mean the s p has grown but not in the same rate as as single stock options uh, but you can see that distribution in december of 2018 as one of that period is sort of the similar to what we have now in other words it's 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 very spread out over you know a whole lot of strikes and if you remember the december 2018 period it it just felt like this kind of relentless drawdown like we just kind of kept getting pulled lower and and headlines you know everything seemed negative and the market just we had a couple of vicious kind of short cover rallies but it just seemed like the market could never find a, a floor right it just couldn't ever find a place to settle in um and it was right. i think a kind of a frustrating period for people but then we had this december election uh, excuse me december <laughs> december election we had the uh december expiration right. and then suddenly we had this just unbelievable rally right like v yeah. v shape rally off right off of that day the tail is um, wagging the dog way more and so yeah, finally you yeah. have the february 2020 uh distribution and right right and and it's the same thing right it's just it's the same distribution that we have now and and you can just see how that's really changed and and we talked about this earlier you know there was all these very deep in the money put options so you know i highlight the march low which was i think it was tw uh 20 22 20 i think was the s p low in March. And so you could see all those options that went in the money. When those go in the money, you know, they, they, they become one delta options, um, assuming they're long puts. And so, you know, those are just huge deltas that are just push, you know, pushing with the market as it goes lower. Uh, and then every strike, every 50 or so strikes you go down or another, 
you know, 100K or 150K put options that need additional hedging. And that is just this, I think, this mechanism that, you know, cycles and pushes things lower. This right. is fascinating stuff, Brent. Uh, we really want to thank you for coming on to the show and explaining to, to all to us. Where can people find more about your great product and, uh, you know, or if they want to chat with you? Sure. Um, spotgamma.com, S-P-O-T-G-A-M-M-A.com, or I'm at spotgamma on Twitter. And I really appreciate the chance to, to talk to you guys about this. And, um, you know, it's going to yeah. be a very exciting uh, yeah. end of this. Well, <laughs> well Brent, uh, if uh, if there's uh, some fireworks on the elections, we might have you back next week. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate you coming on because actually I didn't realize this this point about the distribution of this of. Uh, of the open interest. I had no idea about it and how this is actually much different and it really yeah. does present uh, something that's, that's different. And as these options become more and more important and as there's more and more of them, it's actually influencing the underlying to a greater degree. So that's why your product yeah. is, is so important to, because it's ending up that it actually means every bit is as important as fundamental or technical analysis. The, the gamma analysis is uh is is very crucial to understanding what's happening in the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Obviously, I'm I'm maybe a little um <laughs> a little biased skewed in my, my view of things, but, uh, well, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I would I would agree with that. And I think, you know, so it's not only a distribution now of what things look like, but you know, however whatever happens after the election, I think whatever way the market goes, the reaction of new or the addition of new options, be it puts or calls, is just going to kind of exacerbate, you know, whatever the move is, right? Right. It's just going to yeah. add sort of think fuel to whatever fire, you know, starts. Be it strap be on the seatbelt. Yeah. Got so it. Strap be, on the seatbelt. Anyways, folks, fun. go check it out. www.spotgamma.com. Brent, thank you for taking time. Thank Have you, a happy Halloween. Thank and you, guys. Best of luck in the election. All right. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> I may have to come hide up there. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, buddy. All right. Cheers. Bye. Okay, Patrick, it's my favorite time talking charts. What do you got for us? Well, you know what? Uh, we already had so much covered with Brent, so uh, we can keep this a little simpler. But I wanted to talk about just where we're setting up going into the elections and what just happened because we had a big wave of earnings come out for the, a lot of the FANG stocks. And uh, while well, many of them broke pretty badly on the downside, right? The NASDAQ started down, but not too much different than the S&P. But it really was the FANGs that had a big breakdown candle. This is the FANG futures uh, down here, 300 plus points, down over 5%. But it's some of the individual components that were really interesting. Uh, the big break on uh, Facebook was very distinct. Uh, this, um, whenever you have a high, like we saw in August, when you have uh, the sell-off and then a rally that doesn't make a higher high, when it rolls over this way, a lot of people get nervous that this st uh, starts to look like topping formations along the upside. And what's interesting is, is that it's not the only one of the FANG stocks that looks that way. You know, when you look here at Apple, Gaps lower on its earnings, uh, broke all short-term FIB zones on that break. Really does look like it's rolling over. It'll be interesting what happens on uh, Apple as we approach those uh, September lows. Uh, another one that broke really badly was Amazon, uh, down uh, over 5%, $174 on downside. Also pretty heavy break after what some technicians are identifying as a, a double top formation along the top end. And so really... The, all of them are breaking badly. The only one that seems to have actually had a really positive outcome was the gap higher on Google. But what is interesting is after that gap higher on Google, it was it spent the rest of the day uh, giving back a, a chunk of those gains. And so it was it, even even Google had uh, uh, its ankles grabbed and dragged down uh, as uh, as there was much more systematic selling in this tech space. And really what it comes uh, to the question, Kevin, I wanted to have the chat with you. Are we finally going to see a period where uh, the, um, the techs underperform the broader market. So before I answer that, I got to give you credit for this new and uh, kind of uh, imagery you've uh, saddled us with that the, the Google had its ankles grabbed and dragged down. <laughs> dragged <laughs> under that? Hey, why not? I just said <laughs> that. It's uh, it it felt right. It felt it right. Felt right. <laughs> it was a little disturbing, I must say. Uh, 
Yeah, I know, Patrick. I've been arguing for a while that uh, tech is for sale. I continue to believe that, and I think this is just the continuation of it. You know, who knows? Uh, Einhorn might be right. September second might have been the top in the in the tech bubble. I, you know, I, I, I feel I feel that that uh, could be the case. The one part is is that it really has made it very challenging to stay with the trade because of the elections. Yeah, you know, I think that I would have had far more conviction to stay uh, fully short the space. If it wasn't so many of the uh, potential variant outcomes that could play on uh, on the uncertainty uncertainty around that election, right? I mean, it, what what's your take? I mean, obviously we heard Brent uh, talking about some of uh, that. Uh, obviously, it's not that the market is guaranteed to go uh, down, but that it, there's plenty of fuel that if the did become become a chain reaction to the downside on the markets that there's plenty of of gamma down there that could really accelerate a move um and and, i mean what's your take on that so first of all patrick i think that too often people spend too long fussing about uh political and geopolitical events that actually don't end up affecting the market nearly as much as everyone thinks they will And you just said it. I wish that I had just stuck with it and uh, not worried about the election because there's some great trades in there. I look back and I think uh, the fact that we were rallying so hard, people say we rallied because of uh, the fact that we were had a blue wave that was pricing in. I, I think that's BS. I actually don't think that's why we were rallying. I think that oftentimes everyone thinks the market's been moved by these political kind of uh, let's just say uh, upticks and downticks in, in various candidates' um, uh, fortunes. And I don't think it's affecting the market nearly as much as everyone thinks it does. I, you know what? I call BS on that, buddy. Okay. Like, you know what? No, I'll tell you why. Because okay. uh, when you're looking at it, people will go back and look at the last like uh, seven or eight elections. But I, I think that today – uh, the outcome of the elections and the different variants of, of how much the, uh, the economy needs things like a big fiscal spend, um, these things uh, uh, hinge so much on uh, so many different political outcomes. And I don't think you can go back and say when, you know, Obama was being elected uh, or when uh, when Bush was being elected that they that uh, this had that much of a pull like it does today. And so when people look back at history, I think that, uh, you know, they're saying that's not the case, but I think this election outcome is is more important than any ones we had in the past. Like uh, well, it, one of the things I just, I'll push back again on that, Patrick, is that everyone always says that. <laughs> and I know you go, but this time it's real. And I go, yeah, but every time. And uh, the okay. other thing is, I'm just not even sure if you knew the answer that you would know what to do with uh, how to t- position yourself. I, and that's and that's the interesting debate uh, in terms of, uh, I think it, this is where it's almost uh, why everyone has been going into this election with the attitude of, of basically leveraging down or degrossing, as, as Cuppy would say it, uh, just trying to raise some cash, deleverage some exposures, hedge tail risks. And we're seeing that behavior actually happen quite a bit. And so it, this is where I think that unless there's a big surprise in the markets. Um, uh, I think that on balance, uh, there's money on the sidelines that uh, will have more confidence to come back into the market once this cer- uh, uncertainty becomes more certain. Well, so I will agree with you there, Patrick, which is actually a very ominous sign. Uh, <laughs> and, and I, and, and, well, there could be a surprise, which makes us wrong, right? But, right. But uh, no, I, I think that there's no doubt that it is actually... Like, I'm not trying to say that it doesn't affect the market. I'm right. trying to say that it's difficult to decide how it affects the market. And, and sitting there and trading based upon upticks and downticks in the polls and all this is very – it's like a mugs game. And not only that, it's, it's, it's like thinner out there than like Kate Moss on a juice fast. It, <laughs> it, it's, it's really quiet. And the, the orders are getting whipped around. The slap chop guy is the only guy making money in the markets these days because it's just getting slapped around so badly. Anyways, Patrick, the, the, the long and short of it is that I just – I look at what had happened and I said I was the same way. I was too focused on the election and then I missed the bigger picture move, which was the uptick in the virus. Yeah, And that's what yeah. drove the market. 
And so, when you're so busy focusing on one election saying, I'm just going to stay flat until then, <laughs> sometimes you'll miss opportunities and other things. And that's that's kind of my point. All right. So let's keep moving on the on these charts. What I wanted to just touch on that uh, when I was going actually through, uh, I, I have the, like the list of all, of all S&P uh, 100 uh, stocks and I just kind of punched through them all. It's amazing how many of these charts have rolled over. It's really hard to see something that's holding up. But you know what is holding up? Uh, are some of the commodities, particularly we were talking about Nat Gas, and this is the uh, December contract. I know you were looking at the strip, but uh, but uh, when you're looking here on the December contract, that's a fresh high on Nat yeah. Gas, and even then, uh, copper has been behaving very well, even though it's been pulling back. This is more or less, um, in technical analysis, it would just be defined as a consolidation flag, which is often results in a bullish breakout. And so we have not seen like uh, many of these kind of more bullish commodities that don't have that, that heavy backdrop of negativity like oil does uh, are actually holding up very well in this environment. Yeah, I can't disagree, and uh, it is it, it is kind of encouraging to see copper doing better, especially since gold led the move lower, and that was yeah. one of the most surprising things about this week is that we woke up Sunday night to all that bad news over the weekend about record amounts of corona cases, and you would think that gold would have a bit, yet it got, just got crushed in silver or like they started beating it like a redheaded ch stepchild. It was just really <laughs> ugly out there for those things. And yet you're right. There are some commodities like copper, uh, nat gas, and uh, even lumber that hung in there. And uh, I'm actually hopeful that uh, on the other side, those all go higher. All right. So quickly, we're going to hit two more topics, actually three more topics. So let's quickly do this. Number uh, first, I wanted to, uh, and uh, we're going to make sure that you keep this tight, uh, but I wanted to talk about yields for a moment. And, and what, what we continue to see is those 10-year treasury yields in the U.S. actually diverging from a negative market. Typically, we would see yields uh, compressing and, and the, uh, the treasury bonds behaving in their typical uh, you know, risk-off manner where they act as a diversifier. No sign of that on the bonds this time around. What's interesting, the Canadian bond is actually very correlated to uh, the U.S. yields in the rise. But we're seeing, and you wrote about this, was the fact that that's not necessarily the case in Germany. And uh, I just thought uh, you, you can uh, just give us a quick summary of what well, you see here. We're supposed to keep it tight. What, what are we going to say? Well, give bond, me the executive bond, summary. Bonds stink. They're terrible investment. It's actually shocking that they're doing so bad given the risk-off tone of this week. I, I'm actually surprised at how badly they're trading. They're, they're trading heavy. To me, it looks like somebody's biggest selling U.S. bonds, selling U.S. assets in general. You wouldn't think that it would be positively correlated. But then again, maybe you would if you were uh, listening to me because I've been arguing for some time that uh, bonds won't be the ballast for your portfolio. They might end up being the anchor that drags it lower. There you go. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to just show some breadth indicators. This is the percentage of stocks that are above their 50-day moving average. Uh, we've, uh, we haven't we have yet actually hit the lows we were in September. And it's interesting is, is that typically uh, when, that when this approaches the – bottom range of uh, the teens into the low 20s, usually the market is oversold enough to establish bottoms. Obviously, the corona uh, uh, sell-off uh, almost zeroed this indicator, but that's not uh, a common place for it to bottom. And so it's interesting that we are seeing the selling, but yet not so oversold typically. But the elections, I think, will be ultimately the pivot. The final thing, volatility very high. Like we were talking, obviously, with Brent about uh, the demand for options, but the VIX still hovering around 40. It's amazing that we're at this elevated level. And uh, just the, like even the thought of things getting even higher here in the post-election you know i wasn't uh, i was a seller on that idea but brent is uh, making me second guess myself a little bit uh, well, what's your so I'll, I'll give you a little pushback to that theory i actually saw this chart the other day of uh, vix going into all elections and they generally top out the day before and i feel like a complete schmo for not figuring this out and you know getting too excited about the trade of, too early. Uh, fall collapsing, and as usual, I was too early. But I, I still think it goes lower, Patrick. I'm, I'm hanging tough. 
No, I think that's one of the, the benefits. I, of- oh, listen, uh, there's a lot of precedent for that, right? Yeah. I, I keep showing, like, if you go back to 2016, uh, it really does. Um, where, here we go. So the, here, here's the, um, what, where did we? The 2016 election, like literally the day of the uh, after the election, volatility goes from uh, from trading as high as 21 to all the way down to like 14, right? Like it Whoa. just it, it imploded in one day, right? Did not realize that's, that. Well, that's a whole yeah. It, let's say uh, I, got, there, I but, got the one by twos on, so we got to be careful how far it goes down. <laughs> and otherwise, uh, last thing I want to leave it with: uh, so far, emerging markets have held up the best. Out of all global equities, I, I, you know, uh, you've always been far more optimistic at emerging markets than I have. But you know what? Uh, the emerging markets are holding up like a champ in this environment. I'm curious whether that will continue in the post-election period. And I think that's something to leave all of our uh, listeners with going into uh, next week. I don't get to say anything about emerging markets. Go No, please feel free. Well, I was going to say that a Mark Mobius was on crowing about how it's uh, – it's the it, it's ending up being a safe haven. Don't think it's a safe haven, but I did think it was interesting that we have the same haircut and we both like emerging markets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on. Okay, Patrick, this week in trading history, what do you have in store for us? Well, you know what? Uh, we instead of uh, us uh, um, putting on another uh, week of uh, crash porn, I think that uh, we can <laughs> we can uh, talk about uh, some some other fun stuff that happened in this week in history. And so it was on October thirtieth of two thousand twelve, uh, Disney agreed to buy Lucas Films uh, and it, and its Star Wars franchise for four billion dollars. Uh, paying half in cash and the rest in about 40 million shares. And so Lucas will uh, become the second largest individual holder of Disney shares or did become with a 2.2% stake in it. Disney's uh, CEO, Bob Iger, stated in the acquisition press release that he planned to release new movies in the series every two to three years afterwards. And, um, and as for George Lucas, he'll remain the creative consultant uh, on all of these new films. That was something that was always known. But so it's a huge deal. How did it happen? So uh, our story starts off in 2011 uh, when Robert Iger grabbed a notepad and binge watched the first two trilogies over a weekend. Uh, And in in completely unconfirmed rumor, which is pure speculation, was that he made his Star Wars marathon even more authentic when he surrounded himself with Lego paraphernalia uh, and uh, did watch it all alone in his parents' basement. (laughs) But uh, anyway, so Iger needed to uh, answer some big questions about, uh, uh, about Lucasfilm's universe, namely how much could he milk it? Uh, what was the potential intellectual property for uh, uh, more Star Wars installments? And how would Disney assess the value uh, of this imaginary galaxy? So this acquisition perfect, uh, fit perfectly into Bob Iger's vision for Disney, who wanted to acquire companies akin to many Disneys like Pixar and Marvel with uh, reservoirs of franchise-worthy characters to push movies, TV shows, theme parks, toys, and beyond. Bob had huge plans uh, for the company, but uh, could he be trusted uh, to see it through? Who even was uh, Bob Iger, and how did he even end up spending the first weekend contemplating the probability, uh, uh, sorry, the profitability of Padawans? So it's an interesting fact, Kev, that uh, Bob Iger started his career uh, all the way at the bottom uh, as a weatherman at ABC before working his way up. That's uh, that, that's uh, interesting. There's some everyone should Google it. It's some interesting pictures to of uh, him back in his days. But anyway, he continued to rise at ABC after Disney bought the network in 1996. Iger became Disney chairman, succeed, uh, succeeding Michael Eisner in 2005. At the time when Disney was in trouble, 
uh, its once powerful animation department hasn't had a hit in years, and the combative Eisner had alienated many shareholders. Disney's board asked Iger to take over, even though he was described as a bland, scripted CEO whom no one would call a big strategic thinker. Uh, this, however, proved uh, to be wrong, and he had a, actually a very clear vision. He understood that Disney's success rested upon developing enduring characters. So Iger uh, accel um, uh, accelerate the strategy by making acquisitions. And his first was uh, the $7.4 billion purchase of Pixar Animation Studios back in 2006. Iger personally uh, negotiated the deal with Steve Jobs, who was, uh, the, um, was then the Pixar CEO. Uh, the transaction gave Disney a new so uh, source of hit movies, and Jobs also became the Dis uh, uh, a Disney board member and its largest shareholder. And so Iger recalls that periodically Steve Jobs would call him up to say, Hey, Bob, I saw the movie you just released last night. And it sucked. <laughs> and so George Lucas uh, was familiar with those types of calls as he'd been burned before from handling over a creative control of handing over the creative control of his films after losing the final cut uh, to Warner Brothers on one of his first uh, movies, uh, THX 1138, which flopped, and then to Universal for his next film, American Graffiti, which was a hit. So Lucas decided to take a different approach with on his future films. Uh, on the next script, which was Star Wars Episode IV, uh, New Hope, he turned down a $500,000 fee to direct his own script, instead asking for only $50,000, but the rights to all of his sequels. And that was huge. And uh, that movie, along with the other two, grossed a combined $1.8 billion. And after that first trilogy, Lucas was wealthy enough to do whatever he pleased. And so what does he uh, choose to do? He produced a TV show about the earlier years of Indiana Jones, which, is, uh, uh, which were intended to be history lessons. But the, the interesting part of how it all connects was who did Lucas uh, first pitch that Indiana Jones sh uh, show to? Bob Iger at ABC. And it lasted two seasons before it bombed. Uh, but in, nonetheless, George went on to doing uh, what he did best, making Star Wars movies. His uh, second trilogy would gross $2.5 billion, even though many fans thought they were a mess. They were particularly appalled by the bumbling Jar Jar Binks, who became the butt uh, of jokes uh, for South Park and The Simpsons. Uh, criticism got to Lucas, who started to feel like a prisoner of his own universe, and he wanted a way out. So Lucas had uh, paid close attention to how Disney had uh, handled Pixar, which he still referred to as his, my company because he founded it as Lucasfilm Computer Division in 1979 uh, and sold it to Steve Jobs six years later. So it's like a, a love triangle between Steve Jobs, Lucas, and, uh, and Bob I um, Iger. Uh, nonetheless, he, calls, Disney, he called, calls Disney's decision not to meddle with Pixar brilliant. If he uh, uh, sold Lucas to uh, the films to Disney, he figured that uh, there might still be a way to retain some influence over his fictitious universe. Um, much would depend on who ran Lucas films after he retired. Meanwhile, Iger kept the acquisition train moving. In 2009, he, uh, Iger negotiated a similar deal for, uh, for Disney to buy Marvel Entertainment for $4 billion. Their first film of the Avengers grossed $1.5 billion globally, making it the third most lucrative movie in history. The success of Pixar and Marvel acquisitions made it possible for Iger to hunt for more mini Disney's. Lucasfilm was the top of his list. After some negotiation and, re uh, and reluctance by Lucas, it was in this week in trading history on October 30th of 2012 where Disney bought Lucasfilms and the Star Wars franchise. Fans weren't impressed, tweeting, I felt a disturbance in the force as millions of geeks were shocked in an instant. Uh, Iger would uh, then carry Disney to even greater success while um, simultaneously sitting on Apple's board of directors. Uh, so how 
did the two uh, uh, fare in the end? Well, Iger's net worth is around $690 million, while George Lucas is worth about $6.4 billion. But if you think they're untouchable, just know that at the release of the Star Wars ride at uh, Disney World, the two staged a mock lightsaber battle uh, for what was described by the attending press as an uncomfortable amount of time. <laughs> anyway, that's what happened this week in history, Kev. That's a good story. I like it. I like it. It's a little <laughs> bit uh, more recent, which I'm sure... Uh... <laughs> Taylor would appreciate because he's getting fed up of having to go find things from uh, 2000, from 1924 and stuff. <laughs> All right. Let's go on. All right. It's time for the WTF clip of the week. And uh, for this, we're going to get Taylor to jump on here. But how you doing, buddy? Oh, guys, I got a big week. I got a big week this week. Get excited. Okay. So Vlad Tenov, uh, the co-CEO of Robinhood, he went on Squawk Box and he spilled the beans that Robinhood saw this huge jump in deposits uh, into their trading accounts by multiples of, guess it, 1200 bucks when all these stimmy checks went, were mailed out, right? So how does Robinhood justify that? He goes on and he goes, well, you know, it, it really levels the playing field and allows people to invest in their future. And you're like, listen, Vlad. No one is buying two and a half spy shares with these stimmy checks, okay? <laughs> like, those people are buying next week Tesla calls and a YOLO play for those sweet, <laughs> sweet tendies, bro. This guy doesn't get it. Anyway, and uh, I, I hope you really enjoy tonight's pairing. It's quite good. Enjoy. We saw an impact of people depositing their stimulus checks into Robinhood. Did that make you nervous, though, seeing people put stimulus checks into the market the more we lower the barriers to entry the more we level the playing field and allow people to invest their money at a younger age the better off our our economy will be so you listen to me and you listen well are you behind on your credit card bills good pick up the phone and invest in the market is your landlord ready to evict you good pick up the phone and invest in the market does your girlfriend think you're a fucking worthless loser good Pick up the phone. And Invest in the market. I want you to deal with your problems by investing. All you have to do today is pick up that phone and participate. Now let's knock this motherfucker out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, I don't know what was funnier, though, the WTF or your description going in your intro. The stimmy <laughs> check? I love it. The stimmy <laughs> check. You know what? It's I, had, uh, I had a uh, I had a tank house beer, which is a Canadian beer. Yeah. I'm in the middle of nowhere and yeah. it's just a good fall yeah. day drinking a beer. I'll do it next week. Can't yeah. wait. <laughs> Sounds good, <laughs> right. buddy. We're looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us. All right, Kev. It's time for no stupid questions, and we're gonna get Lena to jump on here to uh, uh, set us up. What's, uh, what's going on, Lena? So this week's first question is, my simplistic understanding of MMT is that governments with monetary sovereignty, quote unquote, spend money into existence, i.e. fund themselves by issuing money through its central bank. And the purpose of taxes is simply to control inflationary pressures. Hence, the government can spend freely until it creates too much inflation. First of all, how does the government know how much is too much inflation? Also, does MMT have something to say about the distortions in relative prices and profitability that government spending creates by deciding where to allocate resources and picking quote-unquote winners and losers? Finally, how does MMT differ from old-school Keynesianism other than applying the same framework to the modern monetary plumbing? Okay, this is a good question. I'm going to take it, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, First of all, in terms of the description of MMT, it's great. Like that, that actually is correct. The government can spend until it creates too much inflation. The question then goes on to ask, how does the government know how much is too inflation? And one of the things that we always have to remember is MMT is just a, a way of thinking about, M about economics. And it's not really uh, a prescription as such, meaning that when it goes to 2% or 5% as defined by this, then the government should stop spending. It's more just that 
if this happens, this is what the economic consequences will be. So there's a there's a famous uh, MMT professor who always talks about uh, his name is Bill Mitchell, and he says that MMT is a way of understanding how the economy works, and then how understanding that work how it works, the society makes political decisions about how it wants to orientate itself. So going back to the question, how much is too much inflation? The answer is we don't know, and it depends on each society. And that might be by a lot just following the CPI, or it might be through something else. I personally think that that's one of the benefits of having a bond market that's freely tradable is that you could look at market expectations instead of just looking at actual numbers. And one of my concerns is that you will see situations where inflation will be defined in kind of narrow or or let's just put it um, overly optimistic ways to allow the government to spend more. Okay. So then in terms of does MMT have something to say about the distortions in relative prices and profitability the government spending creates, it doesn't have anything to say, but they do acknowledge that that will occur. And they're, they're fully aware that if they go out and they start, uh, let's just say putting fiber to everyone's home, that there will be more inflation in that portion of the economy where the government is competing. So that's, uh, again, it's, it's, it's not something that they have an answer to, but it is something that they acknowledge. And then finally, how does MMT differ from old school Keynesians and other um, you know, schools of thoughts in terms of monetary plumbing? The big one to kind of think about is the fact that they don't believe, in general, MMTers don't believe that uh, putting money into the system in terms of when you do quantitative easing and other things like that is actually inflationary. When they when they do quantitative easing, it's just a balance sheet swap. It's just a change of, of the structure of the assets that are out in the economy. And then the other thing is that the Keynesians, they believe that you should be going and trying to pay down debts in terms of economic strength. They don't believe that you should have deficits like the like the MMTers would believe. So therefore, one of the biggest changes and differences or contrasts, if you will, would be that as the economy rallies or, or grows, the Keynesian would be paying back the money that they borrowed in the times of, uh, you know, when things were bad and would be just trying to smooth it out. Whereas an MMTer would say, no, we can spend and create deficits until we have inflation. So that's hopefully the answer. I probably butchered some of those things. I'm not truly an MMT or I use it as kind of a framework to understanding how the market works, but hopefully I did justice to, to those questions. Second question of the week is back during the great financial crisis and again during the COVID plunge, after the markets were limit down several days, several talking heads on CNBC and Bloomberg, et cetera, et cetera spoke of the need to close the stock market for several days, like a long acting circuit breaker to calm the markets. My question is, what happens to the long and short option positions if they approach expiration and there is no trading to establish whether or not the option is in the money? Okay, that's a great question. And uh, it is something that happened in 9-11 when the, the stock market was closed. I can't remember if it actually went over the option expiration because I think back then they didn't have weeklies like we do now. But there is uh, provisions in the rule book. And what it is is that the option stops trading, but your right to exercise that option is always it's increment. Like you basically you don't lose it. So if you want to, you can choose to exercise it. So let's just imagine that um, you own some uh, kind of Apple puts. Let's say Apple was trading at $200 at the time. They stopped trading for two weeks. And during that period, you had the ability to put the Apple shares at 195 Well, you wouldn't know because there wouldn't be an underlying Apple stock price to actually decide whether it's trading at a, at a price that's lower than 195, but you always have the right to put it if you wanted to. So you could theoretically have said, you know what, when they reopen the market, I expect Apple to open at 170. So I am going to exercise my puts, even though the last trade was at 200, because don't forget the last trade was, you know, a week ago. And so who knows the price? So the long and short of it is that you always retain the right 
to exercise your options at any time, even when stock trading is halted. And more importantly, to show the uh, the opposite end of that is is that if you're short the option, even if it's closed, it could be put to you. That's that's or, a great point, Patrick. Or assigned to you. That's right. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that is for uh, it for. Oh no, we got to get Lena to tell people where we love the questions. A couple of great questions this week. Lena, go ahead and tell people where they can. So if you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, please submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Great. Perfect. Now it's my favorite time. Oh, skin this is, in the it's not. It's clearly not my favorite time anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me game. tell us. Skin in the game is a weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager, and the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by the next episode, and the currency for the wagers is as follows: it's a Duke and Duke, which is a dollar, a pint of beer. Then it goes up to a burger bet, a pitcher, a case of beer, two, four, bottle of wine with a hundred dollar limit. But as I explained, we need a minimum for Patrick. And finally, the grand kahuna, the steak dinner. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. And then all waiters settle in full and there will be no netting in positions. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, I've, we've had a couple of suggestions that when we uh, finally have our settling of the, of, of the books, we should wait until the Corona is done and have a huge market huddle meetup. Yeah. Just <laughs> I, I'm like, and just, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be able to drink that much beer yeah. or more importantly you, because you're the one who's winning it all at this <laughs> okay. stage. So let's go through yeah. last week's bet. Oh my God. So uh, is it up there? Yeah. So yeah. last week's bet, I, I basically gave Patrick uh, one touch on VNO, which is a Vernado Realty Trust. I, I barely know what these guys do. I think it's commercial real estate. Like I think yeah, it's malls. It's and stuff. real. Yeah. Anyways, and I picked a low level, and I said it's going to touch that. And then Patrick, is it going to uh, choose it? Yes so, or no? And you decided to choose that it wouldn't hit that. Right. So you did one touch, which is uh, it's funny because if you just simply said close above or below, I then I actually would have won. But that's not the case. It's one touch and you won. Yeah. Uh, and no, the irony was is that I've been in a bad streak. And so what I what did I do? I said, I'm going to do the Costanza. I'm going to do the exact opposite of what I would normally pick. <laughs> <laughs> and it still didn't work. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Anyway, know, you know what so, it was? I tried to trick you into like I picked a level that I felt like um, the technicians wouldn't think it would go there. Because I picked this right. bar over here on the left. You see the May bar? Yeah. I picked a low that was lower than that because I thought you right. would go, oh, it's not going to hit that because it's going to that's going to be the support. No, because you wanted me to take the bear trade. You were talking you, no, yeah, last week. You what do you I mean? Did. You were pissed that I... T I ah, oh, I, I, oh I whatever. Okay. Anyways, I got a new one for you. I got a new one for you. All right. Go for it. Okay. What, what do we... What's so the, here what's it the is. So it's on the S&P. It will use the December future. Okay. So and okay. I am going to say that next week, it is going to touch both 31.95 and 34.20. You get to choose whether that'll happen or not happen. That next week, both of these levels will be yeah. hit. Double one touch, baby. All right. I'm going to say it doesn't. It does not? Does not. Nice. Okay. <laughs> okay. What are we betting? <laughs> um, all right. Let's... Uh... I, th I think it'll be more directional than that. So this is why I, I, I think it's either going down or up. I don't know if we, I don't think it's going to do both. I know. So Brent would probably let's, be in let, your boat. But let's let's uh, let's start. Well, obviously, uh, we'll start. I'm hoping with the that maybe it touches it on Monday morning on the one side. So then I'll be on I'll be on the side. But anyway, you bet. There you go. Okay, so Duke and Duke, I, I'll go a pint of beer for sure. All right, I, I could do the burger bet. Okay, I, I'm in for a pitcher. <sighs> All right, case of beer. It's this no netting of positions is my problem. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm up and I can like bet a little bigger. But now nah, we'll leave it at a pitcher. I'm going to leave it at a pitcher. Because we got to right, do pitcher. this 52 weeks. Like it's going to be a lot of cases of beer. 
Yeah. 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 I'm going to go a pitcher. So I'm leaving it at a okay. pitcher. All right. A pitcher or beer it is. So just to clarify, it's got to touch both 31.95 yep. and 34.20. Yep. Okay. And uh, and if it touches both, I win. You win. Yeah. If one of the two doesn't get touched, because the odds are one of the two is getting yeah, touched. Yeah. So one of the two. Then you okay, win. I like it. All right. It's done. We're it's done. done. Sounds good. All right. Okay. All Th- right. Thanks for tuning into the Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Please give us a follow at the Market Huddle. We're on Twitter every day. Give Lena a shout out. She gets tired of talking to Patrick and myself. You can listen to the Market Huddle on all networks, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all the charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. And if you could, please rate us and review us on iTunes. It's a dumb game, but it makes a difference to Apple's algorithms, and it helps us out immensely. A big thanks to our two guests this week, Josh Young from Bison Interest and Brent Kuchubo from Spot Gamma. And Patrick, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna, and you can find me at bigpicturetrading.com. Kev, where can they find you? I'm at Kevin Muir, and, or you can check out my newsletter at the macrotourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends, bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. All right. Youngins, hop on. Let's get this yo, beer. Yo. Let's get this beer over with, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! We're, you know what? So I, you know what? Who, who got us people, this one? Where did this come from? I have no idea. But you know what? <laughs> uh, listen, either you're either you're a fan of the stouts or you're not, right? Yeah, like, but is uh, it okay? Wait, isn't Guinness a stout? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so I, 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 I'm going to take the other side of that. I love Guinness, and this is this is no Guinness. I, I know coffee? Guinness. I, I, I spend time with Guinness, and this is no Guinness. Yeah, you know what? Uh, actually, I had another um, beer from Bandit Brewery that also did this, like, chocolate coffee mix as well. And, um, yeah, it's like the seasonal thing that they do at this stage. And I don't know. It's 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 either you like it or you don't. And uh, obviously, you're in a don't. Uh, yeah. I know. Okay, anyway, rate it. Give it the score. <sighs> I just realized it's from my my it's from a part of the world that I love my Maritimers, so I have to be nicer. No, uh, I, stop I, it! I, Give it to honest rating, buddy. Yeah, that's true. I gotta be honest. Listen, I don't like these. I don't like coffee beers. It just doesn't. It's like it's like fruit and beer. It just shouldn't go together. Take the coffee out of the beer. I'm giving it a sub five. I, I'm gonna give it a four one. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. Oh. I, I was really honest. Uh, well, I feel like if they weren't from the Maritimes, it would be even lower. I don't know for me for uh, so for me, uh, I generally won't go under 0. 0.5. So I'm, I don't see the reason to do that here. But I, I certainly <laughs> am not. I, I certainly will give it on the bottom end of the spectrum. I'm going to give it a five six. Okay, five point six. Wow, these are some low scores. Lena, you yeah, have you know what? Least? Like, uh, I you know what? One of the I always ask myself a simple question that in a rate is like, would I buy um, any th- this again? It's like I, I just. I don't know. I think one's enough. I, one's I, enough. I, I, I think, yeah. Actually, half of a beer is fine. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Lena, did you have this or no? No, I didn't have oh, this beer this time. Okay. <laughs> okay. And and Taylor was out in the boons drinking his own beer on his own. So that's it. So Patrick and I, we got it over with. No more stouts. Anytime I see coffee, I'm not. I'm having not, never having another coffee beer. All right, there you go. No blueberry beer. Yeah, not no until beer. they sponsor the show again, yeah, and then you're right. screwed. That's true. <laughs> well, they won't be sponsoring the show after hearing our reviews. Okay. No. Uh, Patrick. So what's going on? Lena Taylor. What do you guys got planned for Halloween? Um, we got we got a whole bunch of Halloween candies to give out to kids, but we weren't aware that they may they might not be trick or treating yeah, this not year because of COVID. Lena. So. <laughs> Um, we've got boxes of candies that we're just kind of working through every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
show. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here. So, Lena, <laughs> you, you sent me a note when I give my Kate Moss uh, thinner than a Kate Moss on a juice fu- cleanse. <laughs> yeah. You said uh, you sent me a Kate Moss uh, quote, which is nothing tastes as good as thin feels. Uh, sorry, I, I paraphrase it, but it's, she says nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Oh, skinny feels. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I am going to take the other side of that trade. <laughs> As you can see from my physique, I, I would say there's a lot of other things that taste better than skinny feels. Yeah. Steak. I, I agree fries, with that. Fries. I agree with burgers, that. Burgers. Steaks. Yeah, steak again. Ooh. Lobsters. You, you Yo. know what? I'm a sell on. I'm a sell on this idea. I'm, I'm a buy on that skinny. That skinny vibe. I used to be super jacked, and I was like. I was a psycho all day long. I'd be like looking at myself in the mirror. I had, I had like an eight pack and it was crazy, <laughs> but I could not talk to a girl. I could not. I could not do it. I was like screwing up all over the place. I was losing volleyball games if a girl was watching. Like it was bad. But if now you I'm had married. an eight pack, why do you have to talk to, talk to me? Well, you don't see, have that's to. what I thought. I was like, who needs to practice? You can just do some pull ups. And then, <laughs> yeah, did, let me just tell you, it didn't go well. But now you're having who, beers every week with who, who, maybe who getting a beer. Practice, right I'll oh, yeah. some pull-ups. We, That's funny. We did the card. My, my wife, too, the other day, we were sitting watching uh, uh, like a show. And she's like, oh, uh, I'm going to open the Halloween candy. And I'm like, we're in a church. That's a sin. Like that's, <laughs> You can't open Halloween candy before because it will never make it. And guess what? <laughs> it's gone. It's absolutely gone. That's and funny. I was like, yeah, anyway. Oh, that's funny. What are you going to do? <laughs> it's, fu- it's, uh, it's funny. Uh, you that know what? I'm celebrating. Kids, what I'm not again. celebrating Halloween this uh, Yeah, I know. I was just going to say it's funny that the two without kids are the ones going out and buying all the candy. Yeah. The- uh, I'm I'm celebrating the end of my quarantine. Oh, right? yeah. This 14-day right. f- fucking quarantine. Jesus. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I, after landing, like, you know what's funny is that staying at home during covid is easy but when someone tells you you're not allowed to leave suddenly your house feels like a prison yeah. like i, ju- I just were you, can't were wait you like to that get the- patrick were you like those animals at the zoo that you see pacing back and forth yeah oh yeah oh my God. like I, no. I keep walking to the door i grab the door handle no i can't so <laughs> <laughs> just pace back and walk back to the door no i can't oh. so how are you going to celebrate uh, breaking quarantine are you going to go trick or treating or what's your plan <laughs> Oh, I, I'm I'm in quarantine till Sunday, but then uh, then I'm just gonna go and like, I'm I'm yeah, gonna go I'm gonna go streaking up and down the street or something. I don't know. It's like I'm gonna do something. Oh my, oh my. that's an image that I need to no, get yeah, out yeah. of my head. There exactly. you go. I'm I'm Will Ferrell style, old school. That's what I'm gonna do. Oh. <laughs> nice, Patrick. I'm I'm gonna move in and be your neighbor. No, Check no that you do. Out. No, you do not. <laughs> Want to do that? Uh, are you, uh, so you guys are not doing anything for Halloween, then I assume. No. Kevin, you have you have. Uh, I have one teenager, kids. and uh, one no, teenager. we're not uh, we're not doing anything because they they don't want you to. So uh, you know what? But what about like giving out candy and stuff? Oh. Are people actually not going to go out to trick or treat this? I don't know. They all? might, but the reality is that it's. Uh, we're, our, our house is a little off to the side, and, and we often, even when we were trying to give out candy, we had trouble getting people to come to our little section, so I'm not going to go out of my <laughs> way now. And go so so what is interesting for me is uh, uh, my, uh, my daughter is, is um, going to watch a number of horror movies with my 11-year-old. Nice. She, she's like, he, he's like all psyched about this idea that he hasn't watched <laughs> horror movies. So which ones are and, they going to watch? Yeah, what is oh, I, you know what? I, I don't even know. But they're about to go, they're about to do a whole bunch of them tonight. And so I'm like, I'm just waiting for all the nightmares shit to start kicking sure. in over the. Oh, 100 percent, that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, and so so like that. So now that's that's gonna what dominate the next few days for me. Yeah, Levin's <laughs> uh, that's bold. Now that is the fourth child, right? So the fourth. Yeah. Like the third almost raised themselves. So I don't know what the fourth is like. They like. <laughs> actually, you know what? My my old partner on the floor. So I used to trade. Um, uh, on an institutional desk and the guy that was in the pit 
that we would do the ARP with was the nicest, greatest guy. I kind of joke and say, if there was someone you wanted to be in a foxhole, it was this fellow. But he was from this like big Irish family. And uh, he used to be, he was like the ninth, ninth kid of 11 kids or something like that. And when he was growing up, he said like he had no curfew or whatever. And he's like, he's, he's like, think about it. We had like 11 kids. My dad would just kind of look down the hall and go, ah, seven of them are here. Let's go to bed. <laughs> 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 and I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, like if you had 11 kids, how would you like? How do you keep track? Like, I like I already feel like. Make your own soccer team? Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, I, I, I so Patrick, I think like the fourth, I can just imagine like, yeah, what the hell? Horror yeah, movies at 11? Sure. Sounds great. Why don't you yeah. watch Family Guy after that? <laughs> oh, they, oh they've already binge exactly. watched it. It's, it's done. <laughs> Oh my I don't God. know. Fourth, it, I imagine it's either going to be an actor, like for sure going to be an actor. It, it, or it, you could you could call him he. He's a it's musician. He's got the it's curly yet, blonde uh, long hair and uh, oh, and plays uh, plays both the uh, at eleven plays both the bass and the uh, guitar and the ukulele. My goodness, he's uh, he's gonna he's gonna be a ladies' man. Wow! Not if he plays right. the bass. Wow! <laughs> he plays them all three. <laughs> all three. Oh, like one of those one-man bands. Yeah, those are cool. those all, are, all, at, all at once. No. <laughs> but uh, I have, I do have a Halloween story. Okay. All right, let's hear it. Um, since this is the only time I can talk about it, uh, so when when my family moved to Canada, when I was this is like '95. In 1995, we moved in like November, and then. My, the following year, I had my very first Halloween. I didn't know what it was about. All I knew is that kids just dress up in different costumes. They go out to strangers' houses and ask for candy. I'm like, sweet, free candy, why not? Um, so at this time, because we were just newcomers to Canada, we had we were living uh, near Islington and 401, right behind Rexdale. So if you're from Toronto, you know what's up. Um, so my dad... So we, we get into a car, my brother and I, my, my whole family's out. My, my dad's like, okay, get in the car, we're going to go. He's like, why are we getting into a car? Why don't we just go down the street, <laughs> go trick-or-treating? <laughs> we drive for about, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour. Um, I think we did a few stops. We went to Rosedale, we went to Bayview and Shepherd, I think. So all these bigger houses, with, my dad was saying, these houses with double doors, that's where you to go. <laughs> Okay. Double so, doors. You double went, doors. You I was 11. My brother was, I think, five at the time. No, four at the time. So we go, we're, we're dressed up in just kind of mishmash, whatever costume. Some of these houses have elaborate Halloween, you know, setups and decorations. Some of these are also doing little tours in their garage and whatnot. It's all full out. So we're going around different houses, knocking on doors, trick or treating. And we get to even a point where an old lady answers the door and she goes, you know what? I just ran out of candy. Here's some money. And they gave us, she gave us $10 each. And I'm just like, where, where is this place? What part of the city are we in? When we finished and we went home, we had seven black garbage bags full of candy. <laughs> this is my very first Halloween. And they were full size candy bars. Like they weren't like Halloween candy size like the mini size they were like the full size oh henry bars full size you know mr big and full size like family size chips and stuff like that and we were just like oh my gosh this is how we gotta do halloween we gotta go to a rich neighborhood (laughs) so ever since then um that's kind of my tactic now so lena it's oh that's your tactic now you still go to this day (laughs) (laughs) i can pass as a teenager sometimes under a costume (laughs) So Lena, one That's of right. our neighbors is the is the is um, the lady who owns Indigo, and uh, oh, okay. that's a, for those Americans. That's a big uh, Canadian bookstore uh, kind of wellness place, and she's married to a very famous um, uh, private uh, equity guy. Anyways, they go all out. They put this huge monster um, like cat or whatever it is that you walk under and stuff like that and the butler sits there and he, they give out $25 indigo gift cards oh my what? god I gotta go yep. <laughs> I love 
in, Nico. I gotta go. Yeah. And uh, and and it's <laughs> funny what? because people basically, I think the word got out, and people would drive and come back, and I think they've stopped doing it. But for a while, we'd go there and be like, wow. Maybe my dad was there one year. I yeah. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that at one point our neighbor uh, upped it to full size candy bars, and I was like, "What the hell? You're making us look bad!" And so we had to go out and up it to full size candy bars as well because uh, my neighbor picked up his game a little. Well, wow. see, it's it's all competition. It is. Well, you can't be like the you know person handing out tiny little skittles and then you know, or or the that or that sure. or that one that's handing out tooth. Uh, a, a toothbrush and a down, toothpaste oh down the street when when i was going with my kids one time the, the one uh, the one family put out a, a, a cotton candy machine and they would make what? everyone like a full-on cotton candy what? Uh, freaking thing yeah that's like cool. that's right good. and so like it's like everyone was lining up for that like they, they get pretty creative on some of that stuff for sure and then there's the douche that just gives out fruit like apples yeah. Like who does that? But he puts raisins. <laughs> like or that, raisins. Yeah. Or raisins. Oh, who does that? Raisins. Oh my God. Like kids. That's a, it's like they'll egg your house if you give raisins. <laughs> it's like you know you gotta do your first run, run home, and then sort through all the candies. You know, separate the ones that you don't like, and then give that out to the kids that show up to your house. Then go to another run, and then do the same all over again. There you go. My secrets out. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do rollerblades. That was my thing. I'd put on a rollerblades and carry a pillowcase. At one time, I was like, four, I, I think I moved to a new town. I was 14, and I was like, you know what? No one knows me. I'm just going to go out. And I was like six foot tall with my rollerblades on. And people <laughs> opened the door and were like, aren't you a little old? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give me the candy. I'm out of here. <laughs> just, 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 just a little tall. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, have you a good night, and uh, we'll uh, see you all next week. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs> all right. Cheers, guys.